Today we're going to do a crash course of Phoenix Live View from the perspective of a real feature set in a live running production system. No tutorials, no theory, no toy applications. By the end of this video, you're going to have a fill in the blank systematic approach to solving any software problem with Phoenix Live View. Here's a little background on the application we're going to be breaking down. I live in Jacksonville, Florida, which is in the southeastern corner of the United States. Our client delivers fresh groceries from the farmland that surrounds our city to people's doorsteps. We built them an entire enterprise application from front end to back end across all business systems, entirely in Phoenix Live View. It legitimately runs their entire business. We're going to do a deep dive into the order customization feature set that their members use to customize their orders. So let's get into the code and learn how to build anything with Phoenix Live View. The feature we're going to be learning Live View with is the ability for members of the local Fairjax platform to be able to edit the fruits and vegetables that they're going to be receiving for their weekly delivery of fruits and vegetables. So the way we're going to be doing this is we're going to be taking an approach through the Live View lifecycle, which starts off at the router. We end up with an HTML mount and then a WebSocket mount, and then we're going to be making dynamic changes of information on the page, which get handled via handle event callbacks in the live view. And by the end of this short presentation of this feature, you're going to have a very uh, admittedly comprehensive understanding of the live view architecture and why it's so easy to build things and so fun to build things because there's very little, there's a very little amount of boilerplate code when you're building things in live view. You don't have to worry about serializers, adapters, deserializing it on the, on the back end. All those things are abstracted away from you. You don't have to worry about, uh, wiring up anything. Uh, every time data changes on the back end, it gets automatically re-rendered on the front end. Just, you know, this is what brought React to its fame, but we have, we get all of that, but we are able to easily test it because we're using a back end language. We're able to do it all, all of these things on the back end with very little to no JavaScript on the front end. So what we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to be adding and making changes to our order. So we have an order of eight items where we've got broccoli and zucchini and green kale. We're going to be uh, adding cubanelle peppers and collard greens and all these things that we're doing here. Uh, it's all doing HTML over a WebSocket. There's no JavaScript that's powering this. Let's jump into it. And by looking at the very first step, which is going into the router, which is the start of this is the way you're going to be thinking in live view is you always want to start at the router. So we look at the URL and we have a slash edit order and an ID on the page. So we're on line 260 of the router. We have slash edit order. And what that's telling live view is to go visit this live view, which is called member home live dot edit order. So let's pull that up. So here's the edit order live view. And the very first thing that happens in Phoenix live view is an HTML mount and three things happen. We're going to be calling the mount funk, the mount callback, the handle params callback and the render callback. So the very first thing here is, We've got this mount function. Uh, ignore the fact that this says auth mount. We're doing a little bit of metaprogramming in this application. That's not relevant to this demo, but just imagine this just says the word mount and we're just loading information out of the database to populate this template. So we have a template with a bunch of items. So what we're going to do just to display how this is working, I'm going to set the number of items on the page to an empty list. So we're going to see that this page re-renders with no items on the page because, you know, we didn't give it anything. So I'm going to change it back. And the very next thing that happens is the handle params callback, which is step two, where it's going to read the URL information from the URL. So the handle params callback happens here and it sends it the URL that you sent it from, the socket, of course, and the parameters coming from the URL. So what we can do is we can do an io.inspect params and in our, when the page refreshes, we can look at our server logs and see that we got all of our parameters from the URL. This allows us to do special things. Like, for example, if we click on this, um, this link, see how it's showing carrots? What, what it's doing is because we're using the handle params callback, we're actually doing show item details here. Uh, this is handle params is calling apply action. And if it's edit order, which is our, the one that we were originally on, 
All it's doing is just adding this edit order title in the URL. So let's just change that. So we change it edit order to something else. And it's going to render as something else. So in this other one, we have a show item. So let's start at the router again. We have show item details, which that's how the, which we're going to the same live view, but we're going to be hitting a different uh, pattern match on the handle params callback, which allows it to know, hey, like we're seeing an item. So let's do IO inspect again of the params. So when we click on this show item details, it's going to hit our router, go to uh, process the use, this URL. It's going to send the ID of the item 967. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be pulling the item out of the database and we're going to be supplying it to the live view so it knows to re render the price of carrots, how many portions you're going to get, and what is the name of the item, which is carrots, and the, the picture from the database. So the very first thing that happens is this HTML mount happens where we call the mount callback where we're loading our data, handle params, which is loading information from our URL. And then finally, what you're not going to see in our live view is our reference to the render function. So the reason why we don't have an explicit reference to it is because live view has a little bit of magic going on where when you have a template or live view that lives at slash live slash member home live edit order, if you have a template of the same name in the same folder, live member home live edit order dot html dot l e e x, it will automatically call the render callback on your behalf. It's very rare to never. I've in uh, almost three years of doing live view, I've never had to override the render callback. So I'm mentioning this purely because this is the architecture. But the two things you really only care about is calling the mount function to load your data and handle prompts to handle information coming from the URL. So the very next thing is uh, the reason why the HTML mount is powerful is because you don't have to worry about server side rendering because whenever a crawler or a user of or anybody visits one of your live view routes, you're going to be getting a full HTML payload. You don't have to worry about JavaScript enabled crawlers or anything to make sure that your SEO is on point. You get all this out of the box with Phoenix Live View. The very next thing that happens is the WebSocket is also going to call the exact same functions. So we did an HTML mount, and now we're going to do a WebSocket mount. Let me show you what this looks like in the server logs. So let me add some spaces. I'm going to refresh this page. And what we're going to observe is here's the HTML payload, and it's going to do some database queries to pull over our items and our member information out of the database. Now, interestingly enough, when we scroll down from that HTML, we're going to observe that we connect over WebSocket. And if you look closely, these database queries are the exact same of the ones in the HTML mount. The reason why is because LiveView calls the mount callback and the handle params callback both on the HTML side, and then it connects via WebSocket and calls the same two or same three mount, handle params, and render callbacks. So that's why it works. Let me show you how it works. So we're going to uh, let me open up the app.js file. The app.js file gets automatically generated for you for any live view application that is generated from scratch via the Phoenix generators. So if we look at this, the very bottom of the page, uh, we see that we're initializing a live socket uh, object on the front end, and then we're connecting to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to just disable this to display that live view can actually work in a non JavaScript environment in the sense that um, if we refresh this page, we're gonna observe that we do the HTML mount, but notably, we did not do the WebSocket mount. So if we actually go to this page and we try and make changes, none of these things are gonna work because it requires LiveView to be active. Because we commented out the WebSocket mount, which happens at the bottom of that file with that live, LiveSocket.connect, let's actually just bring it back The page refreshes. We see both mounts happening, right? The HTML mount happening here, edit order. And then we go to the live socket mount, which happens here. And then now all of our things are wired up again because we're now communicating over the web socket. So that's the second thing that happens is the web socket mount also calls the same mount function, the same handle params, and the same render callback that happened in the HTML mount. So now it's going to get very interesting because we have a feature set that feels like a spot, feels like a single page application because it's snappy. There's no full HTML reloads. 
It acts just like as if you had done a React or a Vue.js frontend with an API. But we're doing all this with backend Elixir programming. So the way this works is we have form bindings in Phoenix Live View. So we have these things that intercept JavaScript events like the Phoenix change uh, form binding, the Phoenix submit form binding. So what we're going to look at specifically is this add button. And we're going to observe how we make changes for an already mounted WebSocket um, live view. So let's go to the template, edit order.html. Uh, here on line 93, I'm, I'm loading, I'm rendering the add button. So we're going to open up the item view. Let's pull that up. So when we go to render add button, there's a, a little bit of business logic here where, hey, show the out of, show that the thing is out of stock. That's not relevant to this demo. What we care about are these form bindings, which is Phoenix click, Phoenix value. What this does is when you click on that button, when you click on the add button, it's going to trigger an event called add item. And over the live WebSocket, it's going to send an event called add item, and you're going to be handling that on the back end. So it's going to be sending two pieces of information, which we send with the Phoenix value uh, form binding. So we're going to hit add item, and we're going to be sending it an ID, and we're going to be sending it a type. So let's look at that on the back end. So the back end code, here's the handle event for add item. And remember the Phoenix binding on Phoenix click, it targets add item, and then Phoenix value ID. So it sends it an ID, Phoenix value type. Remember that was here, value ID, value type. We send that to the add item event. And that takes us into the next layer, which is the context layer. So the context layer is effectively just an Elixir paradigm for being able to load and save data out of your database. So the very first thing here is we have an inventory context. Let's open that up. And all we're doing is just grabbing the item out of the database, inventory.getItem. So this is our layer where we're actually doing database queries, like getting preloaded items, creating items in the database. So now we're going from the live view layer deeper into our stack. We're going to be constructing a payload and we're going to be creating a pending order item. So relative to this application, what that is, is it's adding, this is a, someone's pending order. And when we click this add button, it's going to be creating a pending order item in the database. And it's going to be uh, replying to the front end like, hey, I just added this um, item to this person's pending order. So let me show you what happens here in the update socket assigns. It's reassigning the pending order on the socket, which has all the embedded items. And so Phoenix Live View knows that when we click this button, add, boom, we add that item to that person's pending order, and we're reloading the pending order on the socket and the pending order item count. That's why this number is going up on the right side. See, it says 12. When we add one, it's re-rendering 13 out of 8. And all we're doing is just assigning it to the socket and Phoenix Live View is responsible for just reactively updating our template. We don't have to worry about any of that. All we have to do is maintain state on the back end and that state will be automatically re-rendered on the front end. And that's effectively Phoenix Live View in a nutshell. You start off with an HTML mount that calls that mount function, which loads up your data from the database, handle params that reads from the URL, the same two functions, and then, and of course, it calls the render callback. Like I was telling you, the render callback is the least interesting part of the Live View architecture from the perspective of a user that's using it, like us, or consuming the Live View API, because we very rarely have to do any uh, logic or any customization of the render callback. The very next step is the WebSocket then calls the same three functions, mount, handle params, render, and then at that point, you have a, a form on the page. Your WebSocket is mounted, and all communication is happening via form bindings on the page. Like, say you have a, a HTML form, like in the Live View documentation, where on the change event, every time you're changing, um, like this email field or this username field, it's triggering a hand. It's on the change event. It's calling the validate callback. We match that with handle event on the back end. And we validate and we uh, show form errors to the user by assigning the change set to it. And then finally, if we hit save on that form, we're going to be actually saving the um, saving this user to the database. All that to be said, this is actually how simple Live View is. And if you're somebody that is that is coming from Spa Land, single page app land, I would love for you to uh, marvel with me in the comments at how simple it is to be able to get spa-like behavior using all back-end code that is very easy to test, very fast, 
All it does is just re-render HTML over the live WebSocket. And this is how you build things in Phoenix Live View. These five steps, starting at the router, ending up with your HTML mount, going to your WebSocket mount, and then making changes via handle event callbacks, which end up going into your context layer, like that inventory. Remember the inventory looked like this. This is where we are getting the item out of the database. And then finally our schema layer, which is just standard Elixir and Ecto. We're just saving things to the database. If you approach every feature set with these five steps, you'll be empowered to code 98%, 99% of any feature set that you wanna build having spa-like functionality with a very simple paradigm to get it all done. This is how you think in Live View when building production grade features. With the fill in the blank style thought process displayed in this crash course, you are now equipped with the ability to solve 95% or more of the problems that you will encounter when building software with Live View. By using the six step process we learned from the order customization feature, you can build it. You should build it. Go build it.